All right, everyone. So my name is Christina Dorsett. If you haven't met me before, I'm one of the librarians over at Wolf Graham. My office is on the main level, and I'm here to make your lives easier. So, hey, yeah. The way that I do that is by teaching research skills. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Um, I have noticed, especially with graduate students, um, especially with high achieving graduate students and probably even more with high achieving graduate students in accelerated and intense programs, you feel like you have this innate ability that you were born with to do research, even though you may have never actually been taught how to do research. And even if you have been taught how to re do research before by me or by anyone else, probably only a handful of times compared to how often you were taught to write a sentence or tie your shoes, right? So today we are going to be strengthening these skills together. If you've seen it before, great. If you haven't seen it before, that's fine too, because what we're doing is repetition. That's how we're going to get stronger. So same with research, right? We're going to go through some really quick tips and tricks Again, making your lives easier so that you have to spend less time doing research for your projects and your career. Yay. All right. So I'm going to get started with just basic library information online, right? This is the library's website. The short URL is widener.edu slash Wolfgram, and it's Wolfgram spelled like this right here. The information on our library's webpage is chunked into sections, and the first section is all about the building, right? Library is open seven days a week. We have study rooms that are available seven days a week. They have specific hours, right? And we also have virtual assistance that's available. That's what this little Ask Us doohickey is, if it'll pop up. There we go. Yeah. So there's a human being on the other side of this. It was supposed to be me, but I got out of it because I got to teach a class today. So um, it's not that bad. It just looks like AOL Instant Messenger from 2005 on the other side. But um, it's a human being. This is an excellent service for when you don't know where to start. When you know that you should have access to this PDF and you can't get it, when you're not sure how to cite something in APA or AMA citation styles, all of that is great for virtual assistance. All of the librarians are available to help you with that seven days a week, right? So if the virtual assistant is not available and you have a question like that, you can still send it in and it'll be answered by the next person who logs in the next morning at eight o'clock. So that is a great resource. Please use it. Um, we also have a good chunk of information over here in this left-hand column. The most important thing for today is library faculty. So this is where my information is. That's me. This is my email address. It's the best way to get in touch with me. I don't work in my office on site every day of the week. So if you call, you will probably be sent to my voicemail, which will be sent to me as an email. So contacting me via email is your best bet, right? And now, just a little bit more before we start getting into the searching, we have a new laptop to loan program. I don't know if you guys have heard of it before, but it just started last semester. We have Macs and PCs that are available to check out for seven days at a time, and then you can renew them for another seven days. So if you're having any issues at all with your devices, you forgot it at home, or you just want a computer with a lockdown browser so that you can take a specific test, you can come and check that out at Wolfgram no extra charge. This is what we call the discovery search. This search bar searches absolutely everything that we have access to, right? Stuff for the business students, stuff for the robotics majors. So what does that mean? It means you're probably not going to want to go here that often because there's a whole bunch of junk that has nothing to do with what you're doing, right? But I will say the best use for this is searching for ebooks, and I'm going to show you why. So using this little tick box, I'm going to select ebooks and I'm going to do my search. And whenever I am searching for a phrase that is more than one word, like occupational therapy, I put that phrase in quotation marks because that tells the database I only want these words in this order. I don't want occupational in the first paragraph and therapy in the last. Not going to help me. 
This is also helpful for whenever you Google. If you've ever done a Google and it says does not contain whatever search term that you included, if you put that term in quotation marks, it tells Google every single result has to have that term in it. So now you are better at Google and at database searching, you are welcome. Um, so what I've done is I'm pulling up one of our eBooks, right? I'm gonna access the full text of it. And now I have the ability to search the full text of this ebook. So let's talk about what kind of information is going to be in a book. It takes a long time for a book to be published, right? There's editors, there's multiple authors. It takes a while. And yes, books do publish different editions, but they're usually not for years later, right? So the information that they put in a book, they're going to want that to be foundational stationary information, definitions, theories, proofs of concept, stuff that does not change dramatically over time. That's what we're going to be going into books for, right? Now, journals, journals typically publish multiple times a year. Some publish once a month, some do quarterly, but that inherently means the information in those journals are going to be more current and they're going to be written faster than your book articles or book chapters, excuse me. So whenever we're looking for current cutting edge information that is what we should be doing right now, what we should be incorporating new information into our practice, that's going to be journal articles, right? But when we're looking for foundational stuff, we're going for books. So let's say that I want a definition by searching within, it's going to give me a highlighted example of every single time these words are used in this book. And it also gives me context clues. But I'm noticing I've got patterns over here and performance over there. So let's fix that. I'm going to go ahead and put in my quotation marks. And then we get this lovely page. Oh, come on. Sometimes our ebooks fritz out just a little bit. And so it'll take a second to load it back again. All right. And that's just working with technology, folks, right? A lot of times, if you're searching in the library systems and you're hitting a bunch of dead ends, um, like you're supposed to be accessing a PDF and you can't get it and something's wrong, it's not you. It's the technology. The technology breaks all the time. So that's also a very good use for the virtual assistant is to um, say, hey, this is broken. It's not working. Then we know that it's broken and we can try and fix it. So let's try this again. I'm going to search within. I want to do performance patterns in quotation marks. And ta-da, we get an entire paragraph section about performance patterns. This is really fast. It's way faster than going to the back of the book and looking through the index, right? So that is what I use this main search bar in the library's homepage for. Other than that, I really don't go to it very often because I head down to the last chunk of information that we're going to be reaching today, and that is these blue tiles. So this is where the bulk of the library's resources live. A couple of things that you're going to need to know here. Number one, A to Z databases, and we're going to be going through those in just a little bit. But before we get there, we also have what we call subject guides. Every single thing that I'm going over today lives in a subject guide, okay? Information overload is a real thing. Your brain will hit a wall. It happens. Part of my job as a teacher is to make sure that it doesn't happen. But if we get close, don't stress out. All of this stuff lives online. And I have five open office hours a week that you can uh, schedule online or over email. So if my office hours don't work with your schedule, that's fine. I can meet outside of them and take that time off some other time during the week. So do not hesitate. If you want to make a meeting with me, email me. I love working one-on-one -on, -one on projects, okay? But subject guides, that's going to be where all of this stuff lives. If we get going and I forget to go back to the subject guides and show you that, know that this is where that lives, okay? Sometimes I get going so fast, I don't remember what I've covered and what I haven't. But 
The last thing that you'll probably use over in the blue tiles is interlibrary loan. We're going to talk about that just a little bit more in a bit, but it's us saying, hey, you pay enough money coming here to school. You don't need to pay for articles or books. We will provide them for you. We are friends with other libraries and those libraries will lend them to us. So anytime you're doing your searching and you hit that lovely little paywall that says for $50, you can read this entire article, do not do it. We will cover that for you, okay? Databases are collections of digital information, okay? But they actually work in a very specific way. So before we even dive in, let's talk about what databases do and how they're a little bit different from a search engine like Google. So a database searches through the title, the abstract, and the record information of every article if it's a database that deals in journals, right? So if it's a database full of articles, it's gonna look through the title, it's gonna go look through the abstract, and it's gonna look through something that we call section headings. And those are the big library secret that will actually make your lives easier. So knowing that, it helps us know how we should start thinking like a database. So a database does not think in complete sentences. It thinks in topics, right? Because you, you're limited. You can only read through the title, the abstract, and some tags. So those tags have to be right. And in the library world, we call those subject headings, but what everyone else would call them are hashtags. The secret is that librarians work in the databases and they make sure that all of the hashtags are linked to each other and they control the vocabulary. So you don't have to just guess what's going to get you the best results. They will tell you what gives you the best results. So that's what we're working in today. And we're going to start in one of my favorite databases called CINAHL. So CINAHL is for nursing and allied health. That means it is going to have a nursing focus. So for you guys, you are going to want to enter your discipline into the majority of the searches that you do here. But that's okay, because CINAHL is a nice small pool, right? We're going to be fishing for information that is all about nursing and allied health. So you're not going to be getting wet lab reports about my studies doing exercise trials. That's that's not what we're going to get here, right? We're not going to be doing like things that aren't related to what you're into. So when we start searching, we're going to start searching with the smallest pool. Also, when we search, or at least when you search with me, I keep a Word document going. And that's because after you go through the effort to get a good results list, you deserve to take a break because you will hit information overload if you try to go through that results list after the process of creating it, right? Eventually you will hit that wall. So I want to create a system where you can take breaks and come back and not lose your place or any of the things that you found. And so I'm gonna demonstrate the ways that I do this. We are in CINAHL. We know that it's CINAHL because it tells us right up here. And now let's start our search. We are going to do occupational therapy and autism. So whenever I was saying that databases think in topics and not in sentences, a sentence that you might be tempted to search is occupational therapy helps autism. That is actually not going to help you because you're saying that you now need the word help in the title or the abstract of that article probably not going to exist, right? Probably going to throw out a lot of the articles that are genuinely on occupational therapy and autism. So when you're typing in your searches, think about the topics and not how they relate to each other. That's also a really good way to beat your own bias, right? Everyone has their own natural bias, just comes into play, even when you don't think about it. Well, this is one way to fight through that, right? If you're searching for vaccines cause autism, you're going to be getting a completely different list of results than just vaccines and autism. But databases have a nice little way that you can make these terms relate to each other. So you may have seen this drop down menu a million times before, and I'm going to describe what it does. It tells the database how these two terms relate to each other. So 
99% of the time, we are going to be using an and. And I like to think of them as pictures of cats and dogs because it makes me happy. So if I search for pictures of cats and dogs, every single picture is going to have a cat and a dog in it. And that's what we usually want, right? If I'm searching for occupational therapy and autism, every single result has to have these two things in it. Occasionally, and we're going to go through this a little bit further, but occasionally you might accept two terms that mean the same thing for you, right? With my nurses, I'll say the difference between a pressure ulcer and a bed sore. Well, they're the same thing. It's just two different terms. In that case, you could combine them with an or. So I would accept pressure ulcers or bed sores. Either of those, they mean the same to me. I want all of those results. We're going to get into where this really comes in handy in just a little bit. But remember, cats or dogs, your picture may be a cat, your picture may be a dog. Either way, it'll make me happy. Now, every now and then, like literally probably only five times in my career, you might use a not modifier. So this comes in handy whenever you're getting results that have nothing to do with what you're looking for. And a lot of times it's because we have a homonym, a word that has two different meanings. So a cell to a biologist and a cell to a criminal justice student are going to be two completely different things. And if you're not searching in CINAHL, where everything is focused on nursing and allied health, if you are searching in the main library database called Discovery that has everyone's information, you might get back some results that have to do with criminal justice. So you would add not crime or not prison, not jail, to weed out the results that aren't actually what you're interested in. So that's how these guys work. And 99% of the time, we're going to be using an and. Something else that I'm just telling you guys, because you're more advanced, I wouldn't burden the undergraduates with it. Hyphens in database land can be read as a not modifier. So if you're in a lovely profession like speech language pathology, where you have a nice little itty bitty hyphen in there, don't search using the hyphen. Just take it out and use a space instead, because you could accidentally be throwing out the word language from all of your searches. So if you do ever run into a problem where your results look completely wrong, and then you look back and you say, oh, this phrase has a hyphen in it, that's probably going to be why. Okay? All right. Let's run this search. This is what I would call a basic search strategy. You're typing in your terms. You're using your Boolean operators. You're seeing what happens. We get our search results. Awesome. The first things we're going to do are add our limiters. So publication date. Since you're in school, it might depend on your assignment. When you're not in school anymore, a good rule of thumb is three to five years, right? You want to stay as current as possible. We also want to make sure that we're getting academic journal articles and not magazines or dissertations. And let's just go and make sure everything is in English. Now, 600 is still far too many results. This is just an example. I'm not even going to save this one in our little Word document. But this is the process. You do the search. You add the filters. You assess your results. So, like I said, this is a lot of results, but that's okay, because I'm going to show you how to access everything in our databases. The first way is whenever we have this PDF, HTML, or sometimes it'll say linked full text. And this is a one click. You click on it. It should open in your browser window. Boom, you've got your PDF. I do recommend downloading it. But if you don't want to download it and keep it in your computer, you can grab a permanent link right here, this little chain icon, and this link will bring you back to this PDF every single time. This is a link that can be shared through email, it can be saved in a Word document, that's how we're going to save our results list, and it can also be posted in message boards. So, when you are working in group projects, whenever you want to get feedback from some of your instructors, whenever you just find something cool and you want to share it with another classmate, do it using the permanent links. It's super easy. Um, and by using the permanent links, you know that only people with Widener access can access the PDF. So that helps us keep everything in copyright clearance, which probably doesn't matter a whole lot to you guys, but that's okay. It, it does matter a lot to the library. So the first way we access things is whenever we see the PDF and HTML full text. The second way is whenever we see full text finder. And in CINAHL, sometimes it's hard to get the full text finder results. We may have to wait until we go out into 
Medline. Yeah, I'm not running into any of those, so we will talk about that in a second. But the third option I have seen a few for, and that is Iliad. Iliad is interlibrary loan. Interlibrary loan is down here in these blue tiles, and it is what keeps you from having to pay for articles and books. And that's also for things that you just want to read with like all your free time. Um, but if you do have like a popular book, um, we had the Jeanette McCurdy autobiography, it cannot stay on the shelf. So if there are popular books that you want, you can absolutely request them through interlibrary loan. You don't have to use it just for academic stuff. So whenever you get this Iliad option, we want to go to Iliad Wolfgram, and that is going to open up my article request form that is already filled out. I don't have to copy and paste. I don't have to worry about putting things in the right field. It's done for me. All I have to do is hit submit the request. Super easy, right? We're trying to make things like this more streamlined. After you hit submit the request, it'll take three to five days to get an electronic article. It does not take that long, but interlibrary loan works Monday through Friday. So if you make the request on a Saturday night, yeah, you're probably not going to get it until Monday afternoon, right? But I have definitely come in on a Monday, made a request for an article, and had it by that afternoon. So it is very quick. Don't let making an interlibrary loan completely ruin your project. Once the request comes in, you will get an email. That email may have the PDF of the article attached to it, or it may have a link that'll ask you to log into your interlibrary loan account. It is the exact same login as your email and as all of the library services. Now we've got our results. We know how to access them once we find something that we like. And so the way to find something that you're interested in quickly is to use the information that is in what we call the record. So when you click on the title of an article, it's going to open up the information that the database has about that article. So remember that I said the database is searched through the title. They search through the abstract here, and they also search through subject headings. And so that's what these guys are. We're going to dig into those in just a little bit. But before we do, whenever you are assessing an article, start with the end of the abstract. It is not a novel. There is no twist ending. They're not going to switch it up on you. It's literally just an explanation of how they found out what they found out so that you can reproduce it on your own if you need to. I start with the last sentence and I work my way backwards. Okay, so scores and performance and satisfaction of selected goals were higher in the intervention groups than in the other groups. That is my biggest, biggest piece of advice for you whenever you are reading articles. Start with the bottom of the abstract. Do not waste your time with the methods and the results, trying to dig through all of the data. You don't need to do that if you're not even interested in the findings. Next is my favorite part. It's the subject headings. So everything that's blue and underlined in a database is a link. And like I was saying, these hashtags are controlled by librarians. So every single article on the topic of autistic disorder is going to come up whenever I click on this link. So whenever I'm working in a basic search strategy where I type in what I'm interested in finding, I see what's out there, and then I try and find more similar results, this is how I do it. I find an article I like. I assess it using the abstract, and then I use the subject headings to find similar articles. And again, I'll just be adding my other terms. All right. So these little letters are field codes. Field, like title, author, abstract, field, right? So if you're using the database's links, and these little field codes come up, but you're not getting any results, take out the field codes. Again, databases are searching through the title, the abstract, and the subject headings. So if it's not in the subject headings, but it is in the abstract, take out the field code and you'll get that result. So whatever your results look like, they can always be manipulated to get different results. So if you're not getting enough, take out some of your search terms. If you're getting too many, add a new search term. Okay, and so we've got our results list. We're going to add our limiters, so past five years. So now we're actually getting into the sweet spot that I would consider for a results list size. All right. So the filters that I like are publication date, source type, and language. 
I don't like using the gender and the geography and the public and all of that because a lot of articles just don't include that information because it's not important to the article. Don't worry about those, but using language, every article is going to have what language it's written in the, in the information about the article, right? Language, pretty safe bet. Publication date, pretty safe bet. But when we start getting into age and gender, a lot of articles just don't have that information. So again, don't drive yourself crazy. Just use what gets you into your sweet spot, which for me is between five and 50 articles. So this is a few more than that. It's okay. It's fewer than a hundred, but... Um, that is what I go for because if I have five, I can use these skills to get more. And if I have below a hundred, I go with 50 just because it's a nice little round number. Um, you actually stand a chance of skimming through all of the articles that are out there. So now that we have this results list in my sheet, I am saying that this is in CINAHL. I'm just going to copy and paste the terms that I used. And then I'm heading over here to the share button. So this is going to change within the semester, sorry, but it'll be easier. Um, it will change so that the URL here in the actual browser will take you back to the results list. You may think that this one would, and it does not. If you save that URL from the browser, it will be a dead link and it will take you nowhere. Everything will be deleted. Instead, we're gonna go to the share button and we're gonna grab this permalink. In my Word document, my trail of breadcrumbs, whenever I click on this link, it is going to run this search for me again. So I am actually going to include that there were 79 results because if a new article has been published on this topic, it'll show up on this results list the next time you click that link. And if you keep track of the number of results on your list, you're going to know immediately whenever a new article has been published. And you'll be able to decide then whether it will be included or excluded in your research. So just a couple of tips that make your life easier. Now, if this was what I was working on, I would stop. I would take a break because this is actually a lot of work, right? We're figuring out the preferred terms. We're trying to whittle down our results list. It's a lot of work. So take a break. Look away from it. Go color. I don't care. But come back with fresh eyes whenever you start to assess your articles. And don't waste time trying to get into the full text of the articles when you have the abstract, because the abstract is going to let you know whether or not you're interested. As I said, this is the basic search strategy and it works pretty well. It's what people use most of the time, I'm sure. But I prefer using an advanced search strategy. Basically, I'm trying to find my hashtags first. And this comes into play whenever we're dealing a lot with populations and identities. So what makes a good search term, all right? We're looking at pop population, so that can be individual characteristics, that can be the issue that they're dealing with, that they're getting assistance with, um, basically any of the things that make that person who they are. Um, other good topics are interventions, right, or even locations. So location can be Pennsylvania. Location can also be a physical therapy clinic. Location can also be a rehab facility, right? So all of those things are different topics that you can use to refine your results so that you're getting what you actually want. I am going to be searching for the hashtags, and this really comes in handy when you're dealing with identities. So what we're going to start with is age groups. So in CINAHL, and we would not have known this otherwise, it does not like the term age groups. It prefers names grouped by age. How would I have ever searched for that using the basic search strategy? I wouldn't. But if you type in age groups and you get a result about it, it probably has this linked in the subject headings. So this will be in the hashtags. Whenever we're back in this backend interface, and I got here by coming to the upper menu and going to send all subject headings. When we click on this link, it is going to give us other related terms and show us how they're related to each other. So this is under named groups. I'm going to scroll until I get to the bolded term. So here we go. Named groups by age. Everything on this list that is up and to the right is a broader term. It's a bigger umbrella. You're going to get more results. So a child 
is a named group by age. So when you search for named group by age, which you probably wouldn't do, you would get all of the results of everything that is down and to the left. So if you're not getting enough results, try using a broader term. If you're getting too many results, go down and to the left. That will give you fewer results. It's a narrower umbrella. Let's go over here. This cute little chat icon is what we call a scope note. This does not like left-handed people. Um, so groups of individuals as defined by their age, specifics available, great. Let's get into those specifics. So let's see for child. Child in this database is any age between birth and adolescence. Um, that's not actually enough information, is it? So let's head over to adolescence. And this is what we really need to know. So adolescence in this database is a person between the ages of 13 and 18. And a child in this database is from birth until 13. So if you're interested in pediatrics, you're going to want both of those terms, right? Well, if you were paying attention, which I know you all were, you absolutely already know what I'm about to do. I am about to combine these two search terms with an or because I'll accept either of them because I'm interested in pediatrics and that's anywhere from birth until 18 for most people, right? So let's go ahead and we're going to run this search. That search has been run in this new tab. I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab some other terms. So I'm sticking with the same things that we've done before. So we're going to do autism. And they prefer the term autistic disorder. So we're going to click that guy. We can check the scope note. Make sure that it is what we think it is. And now I want to add another term. And again, the instructions for doing all of this searching behind the scenes are available in our database tutorials and they're all numbered and labeled. I'll show you them in just a second, but roll with me right here. Okay, occupational therapy. This results list is going to be autistic disorder and occupational therapy. So every result is going to have those two terms. And what I'm gonna do is copy and paste these together. So this result right here, We'll have the age limiter so that everything will be about pediatrics. And it's got our topics of occupational therapy and autism. We just had to copy, paste, copy, paste. And that's another reason why I'm recording this so that you guys can look at it later. So let's search. We had almost a million results with just the age limiters. That would be expected, right? You're finding absolutely everything this database has on adolescents and children. Um, and now when we add these, we get a much better results list. Let's go ahead and do our publication date limiter. And then again, I do like using academic journals and then making sure everything is in a language that I can read. So again, we're around about 70 results. I hit the share button, I grab my permalink, and I save my work. So let me go back and copy and paste these guys so I really do save everything. By searching this way, going to the subject headings, figuring out the hashtags first, it's a quicker process, right? It's just a faster way to get where you were going to get anyway in the first place. But if you don't want to do it, you forget how, or you just don't feel comfortable with it, don't worry, as long as you find one result on your topic, the subject heading will be in that results record. And it'll be a link that you can click on to find all of the other results on that topic. All right. Moving on, Medline. So how many of you have used PubMed before? How many of you hate PubMed and never want to see its stupid interface ever again? That's because it is an index. PubMed is an index. It is not providing full text for everything that's indexed within it. That means you're going to be getting results on PubMed that hit a lot of paywalls. And a lot of times we access PubMed through PubMed.org instead of accessing it through the library's resources. So it doesn't even recognize that you're a Widener student who has Widener access. So instead of dealing with any of that, I'm going to go to Medline. Medline fishes in the same pool as PubMed. It's all National Index of Health, or sorry, National Institute of Health. That is what Medline and PubMed both cover. 
They also use the same preferred terms. So in Medline, in PubMed, and other resources like Cochrane, and for doing Google Scholar searches whenever I'm continuing to search on a topic, I will use these preferred terms instead of the CINAHL preferred terms, just because more people use this language, more people use this preferred set of vocabulary, right? So let's dig into it. Databases are a lot like social media platforms, right? We've already talked about the hashtags, but to add just that extra little piece of complicatedness, um, the hashtags for one database don't work for other databases. Kind of like what you post to Instagram doesn't always pick up the same on TikTok, right? We still have to do the searching again for the preferred terms in this language, okay? So that's why I usually stick my searching to CINAHL, Medline, and Google Scholar. Because if you've already gotten the information for those two, you really don't need to go very much further, right? You're getting a lot of information there. So let's get going. Age groups. That is actually the preferred term in Medline. Yay. So I'm going to go ahead and click it so that we can get more information about these terms. So now what we're seeing here is that there are different terms for infant, for child, and for adolescent. And in the scope note, it's going to tell us exactly what that means, right? So an infant, a child between 1 and 23 months, so anyone before the age of 2, right? So again, if we're looking at pediatrics, we're going to want all of these and we're going to want to combine them with an or modifier. But if we're not interested in pediatrics, if we're actually interested in gerontology, there are some other options. So for an adult in this database, it is considered anyone between the ages of 19 and 44. Well, that cuts out a whole lot of adults that usually need quite a few physical and occupational therapy interventions. So what we can do instead is look to a narrower term. So again, everything that is down and to the left is going to be a narrower term. It's a smaller umbrella. It gets us better, more refined results. So if we are interested in people over that age, we will find aged is a person 65 years or older. So that means whenever you search using the term adult, you are still going to get information about aged people, right? Um, because it is lower and to the left. So it's going to be contained in the original umbrella of adult. But when you're really looking for senior citizens, this is the term that you're going to want to use because everything that's published about people under this age is useless for your search. So again, this is just how we get the exact results we want the first time without fiddling about and trying to make it work afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing that we did before where we do infant, child, adolescent. We're going to combine them with an or and I'm going to open that in a new tab. And then we're going to build together the search for autism and occupational therapy. I also recommend using your discipline whenever you're searching in Medline. That's because Medline contains everything from the National Institute of Health, from the National Library of Medicine. There's a ton of medicine out there in the world. Whenever I was talking about how Sinhal doesn't have the uh, wet lab rat results, yeah, they don't, but Medline does. So whenever you're searching in Medline or in PubMed, if you choose to use it, um, yeah, you're going to get results from every type of medicine. So adding terms like occupational therapy or speech and language or physical therapy, those are really going to benefit you in these situations. And again, they use a different term for autism here. And actually, I want to show you a couple of related things with this. So we have autistic disorder, but we also have a term for autism spectrum disorder, and they are slightly different, right? So this is the definition for autism disorder. And 
The definition for autism spectrum disorder is slightly different, right? This is looking at the continuum. And as you can see with the narrow returns, this continuum includes Asperger syndrome and autistic disorder. So if you're interested in the spectrum, you would use that term. If you're interested in only pure autistic disorder, that's the other term you would use. Now, you may be saying these are a little outdated. We actually don't use these. Yeah. Whenever you're dealing with a controlled vocabulary that has librarians in the background deciding what every single term is going to be, it takes a long time for these terms to be updated. So some of them will be outdated, especially whenever you are looking at identities. If you're looking at groups named by race or ethnicity, some of those might be a little bit outdated and just kind of weird. Um, we hope that they're not offensive, but honestly, a lot of these terms are so old that they just haven't been updated to current language, right? So sometimes that is what we find, and it's kind of a bummer, but we have to understand that that's just how databases work because all of this language is so carefully controlled. Um, so, Again, we are going to copy and paste. I love copying and pasting, as you can tell. The information about age with our topic and our discipline. And now I'm getting the results list that I'm interested in, right? So again, I'm coming over to my notes page. I'm saying that I'm in Medline. I've got that. I've got this. And I've got my permalink. Do not forget to use the permalink. You will know when you no longer need to do that because this entire interface is going to look different. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but it will not have EBSCOhost and it probably won't be blue. So whenever that change happens, it'll look a lot different. Um, and again, you'll have this recording that you can go back to so that you can um, review it and see that, yes, there are going to be differences. Okay? So. This is searching. This is what we're doing. We take the terms, we put them together with our operators, and then we add our limiters to get the results list. Once we are able to access those results, right, we got the linked full text, we've got Iliad, and let's see if I can find, ha ha ha, a full text finder. Um, whenever we click on full text finder, it's saying, yes, we do have access to this, but it's not in this database. It's in another one. So, we click on Full Text Finder and it opens up a new tab with a list of links. Um, sometimes these links don't work. Sometimes none of the links work. And in those times, it is not you, it's the technology. <laughs> so whenever you're running into that, one good thing that you can do is use the VA, the virtual assistant, say, hey, this is the title of a PDF I'm trying to download and I can't get it. If I'm on virtual assistants or honestly, any of us, if we can just get the PDF, we'll email it to you, right? Um, if we can't, we'll give you instructions for how to request it through interlibrary loan. So if you're running into a block and you can't get past it, use the virtual assistants. We're going to be there to help you. Um, so this link did work, but they don't always. I'm just going to be honest. They don't. So if it didn't, what I would do is take the title copy it. I love copying and pasting. Go to Google Scholar, scholar.google.com, and then paste the entire title into Google Scholar. Google Scholar works differently from databases. Google Scholar searches for the full text of everything. So you're going to get more results, but they're not going to come through a filter of the library. We'll get into that in a little bit. You can link your library access to Google Scholar and get access to your results in this far left column. So the way that we're going to do that is by going to this three bar icon that's called a hamburger icon. And we're going to head down to settings. This also lives in our database tutorials. That's where the step by step um, advanced search strategies live as well. So I'll show you where that is. I'll try to remember to show you where that is. Um, but we're going to library links and we want to make sure that everything for Widener is checked off. If you're doing an internship at a place that also has a library or they purchase subscriptions to different academic texts or journals, you can combine all of your access here and get 
all of the results in one place. It's really awesome. Um, I know a lot of our adjunct faculty love it for that. So what happens is we get more links that are in this bar column. And what should happen is when we click on an HTML or a PDF link, it should act exactly like it does in our databases and bring us to the full text of the article, right? And again, I would start reading in the conclusion of the abstract, okay? So let's go back. Um, okay, so let's do occupational therapy since we're doing it all day long. And honestly, whenever you're doing your searches, it's going to be for the same topics again and again, just in different places, right? So you're going to have overlap. You're going to have the same results on both of your results lists, right? That's okay. That's actually a good thing. It's showing that you're getting everything, right? So let's head here. Google Scholar has some really great functionality, right? So one of the favorite things that I love from it is that it has author information. If you found something um, through anywhere that has a publication date that's right outside of what you can use, right? It's just not recent enough. It's not current enough. It's, you know, 10 years ago where I want it five years ago. Well, if any of the authors have their name underlined in Google Scholar, it means that they have an author profile that can be sorted by publication year. So if they have done research on a topic in the past, they've probably continued that research in their profession. So it's pretty likely that they will have something that's been published more recently on a similar topic. It's a great tool to use. You can also find uh, their H-Index. So if you're interested in publishing, if that's something that you want to do, go ahead and claim your Google author page now and keep an eye on it. Um, make sure that your publications show up on it and that will track all of them for you and give you really critical information. I also like that they have cited by. So that's not articles that this article cited. It's the ones that have been written more recently that have directed back. And we've also got related articles. Related articles are usually other articles that cite the same sources as this one, okay? So just in Google Scholar, we've got all of these different elements that we can use to get our results. But you're getting it through Google Scholar, which means you're getting everything that's out there in the world. And some things that are out there in the world are incorrect. We're going to go to a journal page, okay? So this is a journal. It's called Mankind Quarterly. You may have been taught how to evaluate journals and web pages online before, and you may have been taught to use something like a checklist. Like if it's a .org, it's more trustworthy than a .com. Or if it has a long publication history, so this one's probably been around for over 60 years, right? Then it's going to be more reputable than something that's only been around for two years, okay? And then there's also uh, things that are said that, you know, if they have an editorial board or an advisory board and they've got a lot of information about the history or the philosophy, then this is all stuff that should be trusted. But the secret is, well, it's no secret at all, the person who's in charge of all of those things are the people writing the journal. They're the people who would want to manipulate you into believing what their journal says. So if you're using those checklists to suss out if this is actually worth your time, it's really limited, right? You're only getting the information that they want you to have. So instead, what we recommend is doing what we're calling lateral reading, but it's basically just finding a third party source of information and a really good third party source that's not necessarily academic, but gives you an opinion on something is Wikipedia. Do me a favor and search for Mankind Quarterly Wikipedia. And the first of you to find out why this is not a reputable journal, shout out what the problem might be. This is not credible. This is not what we want to use. And that's why this journal is blocked in the library's resources. Okay. So whenever you're using stuff outside of the library, that's fine. It's all fair game. Wherever you get your information is good. As long as you can evaluate that that information is actually good. So look for a third party source. Look for what someone down the block says about this source.
Because if you're only checking to make sure that it's a .org or a .edu, you're really not doing the due diligence. We've talked a little bit about different places to get information, right? And different types of information in those places. So whenever we're looking for foundational information, we're going to want to go to books because books have that information in them. Things like definitions, theories, proofs of concepts, stuff that does not change a lot over time. If we're looking for current information, we're going to go for journal articles, right? But if we're looking for public health information, a really good resource is Google because we do not catalog CDC pages. We don't catalog who pamphlets or brochures on different topics, but that is actually really critical information for sharing with your clients. So Google is not a bad word, especially if you're looking for how to share information with someone who is not a health professional, right? They're not going to understand all of the jargon. You have to explain it to them so that they can actually get the importance of it and use what you're telling them to do in their actual lives, right? That's the whole point. That's why we're doing what we're doing. So the activity that we're going to do today will involve your small groups. I've been told that you're already in small groups. What you're going to be looking for are three different types of information from three different sources on one topic. So for a demo, I picked um, a topic of essential tremors. My mom has an essential tremor. I will probably be developing an essential tremor in the next 30 years. So it's something that I have in my back pocket that I can use as a search term. You probably have something very similar in your mind, in your back pocket, that would be a good search term to use, right? So in your groups, you're going to suss out one term. I want you to find three different types of information. So you're probably going to be looking in three different places. So for me, I am going to... Look for some foundational information in our ebooks. Okay. I want a definition. So we've got an ebook called Essential Trimmer the Facts. That sounds like a definition would probably live there. So let's hold, let's go over to the PDF full text. And whenever I search within, let me get this to where I can see the whole page. There we go. Whenever I search within, I'm going to search for the term definition. Okay, the clinical definition of a classical essential tremor. Boom. I couldn't have done that with an index, but I can do it in seconds here, right? I've got my definition. I can copy and paste that, put it in my Word document. I'm good to go. So a different type of information that we've already talked about today would be journal articles, right? So we've got some foundational information. Now let's get something that's really current. I'm going to head over, let's do Medline. I can do Medline. Um, I usually do CINAHL, but that's okay. I'll make an exception. All right. And again, we're just doing the term essential trimmer. I'm doing a basic search strategy. I know there might be other terms that they use for it, but I'm just going to find what I can. All right. And now we're looking at drugs used to treat. Ooh, and we've got illustrative videos. That's actually really awesome because if we've got video, video is something that we can share. Okay, so we do not have access to this. So I would try, well, it says free article. So does it not have, let's see. It just talks about the videos. Oh, it does have videos. Okay, awesome. That's cool. All right, but you still got to think about the intended audience for this video, right? Is this a video that's made for you guys so that you can understand the increasing complexity of this topic? Or is it a video that's made for clients so that they can understand it a little bit more easily and understand the importance of the interventions that you guys are trying to throw at them, right? So think about while you're doing your searching, who is this meant for? And what do you have to do with it to make sure that it goes to your intended audience. So do you need to describe it to someone else? Or is this other person already using the same jargon you're using and they're going to gain from it what you gain from it? Keep those in mind.
So I've got something that's a little bit more current in my journal article. I got my definition from the foundational information in an ebook. So let's go to good old fashioned Google and see what we get. All right. First result, Mayo Clinic. I've heard of the Mayo Clinic. You can go in. You can do a third-party search for Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic Wikipedia is going to get you a big article. I can guarantee it. But this is good public information, right? Symptoms and causes. There may even be a treatment link that has different information available for how to treat things like an essential tremor. So just because something is public facing doesn't mean that it's not accurate or bad. It just means that it's meant for a different audience, right? So your job with this kind of public facing information is to check that it's accurate and make sure that the information is going to the right audience. Predatory publishers. We talked about Mankind Quarterly, right? And that is not a reputable publication, but it's not necessarily predatory. So a predatory publisher is an open access publisher who is in it for the money, right? So open access means to publish here, you pay to publish, and then whatever you wrote is now free and open to the public. It's really great. It's amazing for people who don't have access through libraries to different academic information, right? But predatory publishers will say, oh, yeah, 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 we're peer reviewed. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll definitely do the right stuff with your article. And we definitely won't just charge you money for it. But then they give you an invoice and they don't send you any peer review information. And you're like, hmm, seems weird, right? So you have to look out for these things because they're not reputable. And that means that what they're publishing probably hasn't been peer reviewed. So peer review. Whenever you publish in a peer-reviewed journal, that means that other experts in your field, usually two to three, depending on the journal and their uh, standards, will read over your article and give you feedback on what should be changed or improved, right? To make it a stronger defense of whatever your findings are, okay? So one easy way to make sure that you're only looking at peer-reviewed articles is to search in the library's databases. We have options for peer-reviewed, and we've actually done the work to make sure that those journals are legit. All right, so now we know everything is peer-reviewed on this results list. If we forget to click that tick box, one place that we can look is here. Uh, on the filters on the left-hand side, we've got our peer review filter clicked, and that's a good way to double check and make sure that it's on. So that means that even this open access article that has the little orange unlocked lock, that has been from a peer reviewed publication. So when we click into the record, this source here, the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, is peer reviewed. But let's say you weren't using our sources and you wanted to know if they were. Let's copy and paste the title into a Google search. I'm going to take out that field code because that does not mean anything to Google for sure. Let's take that out. So here we've got our submission guidelines that's already highlighted, but let's go into the journal just so we know where to find it from their interface. And most journals look very similar to each other. At that. Um, and here we have a little bit of information about this journal, what they cover, what we would call their scope, and then more information for your manuscript, right? So we have submission guidelines, how to publish with us, all of those things. And what I would do is look in here and I want to control F review. Double anonymous means that you don't know who's reviewing it and the person reviewing it doesn't know who's written it. So that's just another extra way that we can give a double check to make sure that what we're reading is actually legitimate. So that's an easy way to look. I would look to instructions for authors or submission guidelines and do a control F to try and find the term review or the term peer 
if they're a predatory publisher that's trying to get you to publish and think that they're legitimate, they're probably going to say that they have peer review. So the best way that I have found to check for this is to look at their editorial board. So this is a publisher called Iris Publishers. They do multiple journals. And this was their uh, interface whenever I go to this publisher. They've got all of these different journals and they have editors in chief listed for each of these journals. So whenever I'm doing my research like this, I try and find an editor who uh, works in a language that I read, right? So a lot of these are going to be international. You can still look up stuff for them, but you won't be able to read everything that you find, right? What you want to find are their professional profiles, okay? If they are the editor-in-chief of a journal, it will be on their profile. It's something they would be extremely proud of, right? So... Let's try that. Um, I am a UT graduate, go Vols. So I'm going to start here with Mervat. So Mervat Waba. Okay, so it's the same picture, but I'm not finding their page at the University of Tennessee, right? I see their Facebook pages. I see Instagram, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, right? But none of this says... University of Tennessee. And if they were currently working at the University of Tennessee, they would have a public profile. You can go to the UT website and look them up in the faculty directory, and they are not there. But another thing that you can do, apparently Mervat is the editor-in-chief of Archives in Neurology and Neuroscience. So I'm going to click this link. This is the journal that they are the editor for. And then they are somehow missing on the editor panel of the journal itself. Uh, check out the editorial board. That is where people fall through the cracks, right? So look at the editorial boards, make sure they match up. Um, try and find one of the editors that'll have a profile in a language that you can read or at an institution that works in a language you can read and see what they have out there because they don't do a whole lot of work to do this kind of manipulation, right? They pull a picture from ResearchGate and they pull the person's name and then they usually change the name of their affiliate in some sort of way, right? So I believe she said that she was affiliated with the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. That's not what it's actually called at the University of Tennessee. So knowing that, I also know that this is very suspicious. So in the future, whenever you're searching for articles and you want to make sure what you're reading is legitimate, use the peer-reviewed article filters. And if you're looking to publish, just do a little bit extra extra legwork with the editorial board and figure out if they're actually doing what they're doing. Because let me show you an example of what a profile would look like of an editor-in-chief of a journal. So number one, it's the first thing that's on this results list. And number two, in her about me, off campus, I'm the editor-in-chief, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what you should see. Expect to see this. It will be one of the first results as their pro is their professional profile. And on that profile, they are talking about the work that they do as an editor. Remembered? So we're in our blue tiles. We're going to our subject guides. These are web pages that the librarians have created to help you with your assignments. Some of the ones that will be most useful are our style guides. Whenever you're having to do APA or AMA citations, you can find all of that information here. We have the newest editions um, in the building if you want to actually look at them. But most of the citation information is here on this guide, and this lives online 24-7, right? Um, some of the other guides that will help you are the database tutorials. I talked about this one a lot, right? So this is under how-to guides. We're going to database tutorials. Everything that we did in CINAHL. Um, so again, we go up to our subject heading. We do our search there. We go here, 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 here. So everything that I did, everything that's recorded in this video, all of it lives online so that you can work on it on your own and get that little bit of a refresher. So we have this for Medline, for PubMed, for uh, the Cochrane Library, which is a medical publisher that focuses on systematic reviews. So anytime that you're needing to do research and you want to go ahead and start with the advanced level of research, 
head to the database tutorials and we'll show you exactly how to do that. Here's Medline, there you go. And again, we've got our basic search strategy and our advanced search strategy where we use the medical subject headings. One last thing. I keep saying one last thing. I really do mean it this time. We have health science guides. So I am redoing these this semester. There are going to be more and they're going to have more information in them. They just aren't published yet. My number one thing is I'm separating physical and occupational therapy. I'm sorry they've been together for this long, but they definitely deserve to have their own guides. Um, and so we're going to be doing that. In these guides, we have research tips suggestions for databases, suggestions for print books, and open education resources. So these are free resources that are available to you and to your clients um, that you can access without any kind of payment or subscription, okay? So these are really great for whenever you don't have access to a library anymore. Um, and then we've also got our APA style guide connected so that you can get to there really quickly too. So a lot of our information lives in these subject guides. 